The National Desk, America's News, now. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Didi Gatton. Thanks so much for being here with us. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and a look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following all week. A hold on pandemic-era border policy, Title 42, causing chaos along the southern border. As legal challenges continue and border towns prepare for an expected influx of migrants. And Ukraine's president visits the U.S. Capitol to drum up support for more funding, while some are raising concerns about the aid. Plus, a surge in viral illnesses putting a pinch on supplies of children's medicine. What experts say you should do to keep your kids healthy. And later on, massive layoffs causing concern in the tech industry and all those who depend on their services, what lies ahead for the workers impacted. Towns along the southern border are preparing for a migrant surge as the Supreme Court considers when to lift Title 42. The pandemic era policy, border policy, this allows officials to immediately expel rather than process asylum seekers. It was set to expire on December 21st, creating a pileup of migrants hoping to make their asylum claim at border processing centers. The White House asking for an extension through at least next Tuesday. Officials in El Paso estimate 20,000 migrants are camped out right now as freezing temperatures create potentially deadly conditions. We're wanting to make sure that people are not sleeping outside in the streets. So we've uh, we've opened up two schools that had been closed. Uh, we've worked with the local school district and we're also opening up our civic center. The mayor says along with local efforts, the federal government has called in the Red Cross to help. Here's a look at the latest border numbers. DHS says the number of migrant crossings into El Paso has dropped to 1,500 per day on average, down from 2,500 earlier this month. But more than 3,400 migrants were expelled from the city under Title 42 or deported by ICE over the past week. Nearly 6,000 were moved out of the area to other less impacted border patrol stations and processing centers. As travelers tried to make it home for the holidays at the end of the week, severe weather forcing airline companies to cancel thousands of flights. Amtrak also made cancellations. At least 36 round trip trains canceled or modified through December 25th. Most in the Midwest, but East and West Coast trains were also impacted. And that carried over to Greyhound. The weather has forced many cancellations and disruptions here as well, impacting over a dozen cities. Check company websites for details on refunds and for the most up-to-date delays and cancellations. A high-profile meeting at the White House, Ukraine's President Zelensky making his first overseas trip since the war with Russia, coming to Washington seeking critical help. The National Desk Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman explaining the debate over whether to keep aid flowing. The greeting, a warm one, but also one of want. Ukraine's President Zelensky coming to President Biden with hat in hand, pleading for more support. All my appreciations from my heart, from the hearts of Ukrainians, all Ukrainians. Biden and Congress have already spent roughly $68 billion toward Ukraine's fight against Russia and are poised in a new budget bill to add upwards of another $45 billion. Providing assistance for the Ukrainians to defeat the Russians that's the number one priority. While that comes from both sides of the aisle, there are limits and efforts to block it. We need to say to our European allies, this is their primary responsibility. They need to step up. We have spent more on Ukraine than all of Europe combined. Critics, mostly Republicans, citing a $31 trillion American debt. Meanwhile, more advanced weapons packages are on the way including Patriot missile systems and precision-guided bombs for Ukraine's fighter jets. And the money we're spending, it's a lot, but it's being well used. No Americans are dying. So transparency, yes. Continued support as long as it takes, yes. Getting this right 
is very important for the rest of this century. But how long can and will this support last? Well, the president and the secretary of state are fond of saying as long as it takes, as much as it takes. But unless you define it, uh, it's a little bit hard to call that a strategy. The single worst thing we can do right now is give Putin any signal that we are wavering in our commitment to defend democracy in Ukraine and around the globe. The check writing and weapons supply seemingly as far as the U.S. will go since President Biden continues to vow that no American troops will do any of the fighting. In Washington, Scott Thuman for the National Desk. Scott, thank you. Major cities have seen violent crime spikes in recent years as they also deal with police staffing shortages. The troubling trend has now found its way into many mid-sized American cities. I spoke with law enforcement and people impacted by violence and found from Tucson to Anchorage, Alaska, violent crime rates are on the rise as police departments continue to deal with staffing shortages. Thomas Vincent lost his son to gun violence in 2020. He was 17 when he passed. Um, senseless violence, he was shot. I don't want any other families to go through what I go through. But the violence that devastated Vincent's family is reaching more families. Sergeant Betsy Smith with the National Police Association says mid-sized cities like Tucson, Arizona, Anchorage, Alaska, and Asheville, North Carolina are seeing a rise in crime from homicides to carjackings and sexual assaults. Those cities also dealing with a shortage of police officers. American law enforcement Enforcement is seeing record numbers of resignations and retirements, and we just can't get young people interested in coming to the profession. We need to lift up law enforcement officers and encourage more to stay. Someone who was around the area had heard confusion going on and did reach out to the police department. It took about 30 minutes for them to get there. Um, so we do need more police officers. We also need more officers that look like the community they're serving. And Vincent says he sees more people turning to social media and people putting lives at risk for likes. Smith agrees it's pervasive. She says social media can desensitize people to violence. Ohio teacher Vivian Garrity suing her former school district, claiming she was forced to resign for refusing to use students' preferred pronouns and names associated with their gender identity. Our fact check team digging into how her case compares to some recent similar conflicts in the classroom. Some people's refusal to recognize others' gender identity is leading to legal trouble all across the country. Just recently, a public school teacher in Ohio said she was forced to resign after refusing, for religious purposes, she claims, to use students' preferred pronouns in the classroom. I'm back with the fact-check team tonight. Courtney, this is just one example I just mentioned, but where else are we seeing the, these issues pop up? We've seen teacher suspensions over this issue in places like Virginia, Kansas, Wisconsin, and Baltimore. Here's one example we found interesting. In Milwaukee, a school counselor was fired after speaking at a rally in April of this year. During the rally, Marissa Darling gave a short speech on gender ideology and how she doesn't support the social or medical transition of young children. The school investigated the incident and found that her speech didn't have too much of an impact on students, but the school still fired her in September. Take a look at your screens. You'll see that in November, Darling actually filed a federal lawsuit against Milwaukee Public Schools administrators for violating her First Amendment rights since the rally wasn't at or near the school or during school hours. All right, now there's another uh, case, Connor. I know you looked into this one where a teacher got a big settlement over this. That's right. And this happened in Kansas City, where officials at Fort Riley Middle School agreed to pay almost $100,000 in damages and attorney's fees for violating a math teacher's First Amendment rights. The teacher was suspended for repeatedly using the incorrect pronouns when addressing a student. According to the teacher's legal complaint, she'd been told by the school's counselor that the student preferred a different name than what was listed as their legal name on enrollment documents. The teacher claimed that the student never directly asked to be called a different name and that the school school district didn't have a formal policy about preferred names and pronouns. As part of the settlement, school officials agreed to issue a statement that the teacher was in good standing without any disciplinary action against her at the time of her retirement in May. Okay, some similarities in these cases, but important to know that every case is a different case and it has all the different particulars. But ladies, good work on this. And you can find links to the fact check team sources on our website, thenationaldesk.com. You can also scan that QR code on your screen.
Straight ahead on the national desk, we take a look at where lawmakers are considering giving themselves a raise despite poor attendance to their meetings. The National Jazz team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America, starting in Oregon, where Jackson County officials have issued a state of emergency due to code and water violations at marijuana grow sites. Jackson County declaring a state of emergency will prevent any issuance of new hemp licenses. So anyone currently growing can continue but people looking to get into the business are out of luck. Production and processing of cannabis has resulted in significant impacts to Jackson County related to enforcing compliance with county codes, straight criminal, state criminal law, state water law, and jeopardizing the public health, safety, and welfare of our citizens. It's part of the county's overall effort to combat illegal grows in the Rogue Valley. Those efforts include additional law enforcement resources. And we have a continued lack of funding and resources to properly regulate and enforce county codes, state criminal law, state water law, constitutes an ongoing extreme risk to public health and safety and continuing to cause significant impacts on our county. The county commissioners also declared a state of emergency regarding illegal grows last September, but that simply revolved around getting extra funding. This declaration, however, does not bring statistics on grows like it did last year. It's not a problem. If, if you if, if you look, what we basically say is that it says what led to the rise of 2021 and those statistics are continuing. continuing. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. The state of emergency will expire on December 31st of next year. In New York, members of the state assembly and Senate are considering giving themselves a 56% pay raise as critics call out their poor attendance. Only five out of 19 Veterans Affairs Committee members attended a recent hearing about veterans' needs, prompting many state lawmakers from both sides of the aisle to speak out against a potential raise. Is that the way to ask for a pay raise, by not showing up for work? But it's very typical, right? A lot of them don't show up, and it's just such a shame. And a lot of the public doesn't realize what happens. State Senator Sue Serino has introduced a bill that would force legislative pay raises to go to the public for a vote. In Tennessee, Bristol residents are ecstatic about the return of a beloved inflatable duck. Look at it. Known to locals as the Christmas duck, Jonah Rasnick bought the duck seven years ago, put it on his roof for all to see. The duck soon became a Christmas tradition for locals who were heartbroken when the duck couldn't be inflated last year due to wear and tear. This year, the community pitched in to buy a new duck and keep the local tradition going. I was going through some personal things that were a little difficult and coming home for Christmas and being able to see the Christmas duck just made all the difference. It's hard to not have Christmas without the Christmas duck. Rosnick says people write him letters to thank him for the joy the duck brings during the holidays. I'd say it's better than the lights. I love that duck. The Department of Justice issuing an urgent new warning for kids online. The rising threat they're seeing straight ahead.
With the season of giving upon us, we have a special story about one couple who turned their personal tragedy into their passion to help others. The National Desk Mark Hyman has the story in today's Inside Your World Investigates. It's quite an experience. Trent Barcroft had a very successful 34-year career with Chrysler in the U.S. and abroad. He and wife Kathy spent nearly two decades living in the Middle East and Africa. It changed our lives. Mm -hmm. We went in a completely different direction than I would have expected. In 2009, Trent became CEO of Chrysler of South Africa with responsibility for nine countries. We were flying. Yeah, it was really going well. But just weeks after a record-setting year, tragedy struck. In early 2013, Trent and Kathy were driving in Johannesburg when a car struck them from behind. Trent pulled over to exchange information with the other driver. Guy just sticks a gun in my belly and shoots me straight away. Doesn't say a word, doesn't demand anything, just shoots me. Sorry. The brazen daytime robbery left Trent on life support. He eventually recovered and resumed his daily routine, but life didn't return to normal. Despite identifying the shooter and accomplices in mugshots and surveillance video, the investigation went nowhere. We didn't receive any kind of justice when it was at hand. We knew the people. You know, it was just that close. That hurt worse than the physical wounds. Trent retired and they moved to his native Georgia. He and Kathy decided to turn their sense of injustice into a new mission. They became crime fighters. To be a victim of crime and to be able to have a chance to do something for someone else, to, for other victims of crime, is huge to me. Kathy began working as a digital forensics investigator in suburban Atlanta. She quickly got the attention of her boss, DeKalb County District Attorney Sherry Boston. She immediately um, kind of jumped in and impressed uh, my investigative leadership team as somebody that was just absolutely passionate, committed, dedicated. Kathy has analyzed more than 100 cell phones and digital devices in just the past six months. Critical evidence, the DA told us, in some of the most violent crimes, including murder. Trent, who loves dogs, took a different path. I bought the dog. Show me, show me. Yes, good girl. He purchased an elite canine trained in detecting electronic storage devices as small as a dime. He was outraged to learn these devices can hold thousands of images and hours of video of children being sexually abused. SD card taped to the back of that. I went and got myself trained. We're now a certified canine and handler team. Good girl. For more than four years, Trent and his canine Lizzie have made themselves available to Georgia law enforcement agencies to help hunt down predators abusing children. And he doesn't charge a penny for his services. Doesn't cost him anything but pick up the phone and say, be here at 5 o'clock in the morning. We're going to execute search warrant. Bring your dog. The Barcrofts have found a new purpose in life. They told me they've indefinitely postponed their retirement. This may sound odd, but was February 9th, 2013, a blessing in disguise? It was a horrible day, obviously, but for me, it gave me, it, it enlightened me with a passion of something that I'm, I just love doing. So I'd have to say it was really actually a good experience now, for sure. A really good thing that happened. For Inside Your World Investigates, I'm Mark Hyman in Atlanta. Incredible. The Barcrofts, who describe themselves as comfortably financially, have earned the right to a quiet retirement. But all the law enforcement officials who spoke with our team had nothing but praise for Trent and Kathy's commitment and dedication to their work. Right now, the Department of Justice issuing an urgent first of its kind public safety alert for boys. They're seeing a dramatic spike in financial sextortion schemes with at least 3,000 minors already targeted this year. The DOJ says online predators use social media to start communicating with their victims. That's generally boys between the ages of 14 and 17. But there have been some even younger. Victims are tricked into sharing explicit photos which predators threaten to share with family and friends unless the victim pays them. At least a dozen victims have died by suicide as a result of these crimes. 
The Justice Department encouraging parents to talk with your children about how to identify suspicious accounts and what to do if they're targeted. You should report and block the account, then contact the FBI. Danger behind the wheel, ahead on the national desk. Why hundreds of thousands of people are being told to keep their vehicles parked. Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now, a five-month-old baby back home in Columbus, Ohio, after police say he was kidnapped by a woman who stole his mother's car. And one woman in Kentucky, look at her face here, $175,000 richer after receiving a winning scratcher during her company's holiday gift exchange. The best exchange ever. Those stories much more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, the suspect accused of attacking the Speaker of the House's husband, David DePap, due back in court next Wednesday for formal arraignment. And the end of Title 42, once again up in the air as asylum seekers wait for the Supreme Court to decide on an official lift date or keep the pandemic era restrictions in place. It's considered an early indicator of what could be in store for your money in 2023. The National Des Entre El Nishar explaining why economists are keeping an eye on the housing market. When it comes to the housing market, just about everything is slowing down. After more than two years of home prices rising at a breakneck pace, many buyers are backing out. That slowing demand has mortgage rates falling for the fifth week in a row, according to Freddie Mac, an average 30-year fixed now at 6.31%. A year ago, it was closer to 3%. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell is taking notice. Activity in the housing sector has weakened significantly. On a mission to bring demand in line with supply. But a warning sign came Tuesday with news that supply isn't improving. According to census data, plans for future projects are dwindling. New building permits in November were down more than 22% from a year ago. CEO of National Association of Home Builders Jerry Howard points to rising rates pushing away first-time buyers and... It's also the fact that cost of construction is still like 10% higher than the inflation rate is. Economist and professor Dr. Jeffrey Harris says the signals from the housing market are a sign of more hardship for the economy as a whole. When interest rates rise like they have been fairly quickly this year, we're going to see a lot of pinching on the home budgets for the near future. Pinched budgets are a big reason why economists at Fannie Mae are forecasting a modest recession in the first quarter of 2023 with a recovery the following year. A lifeline that could protect the U.S. from a recession is the still strong labor market with far more open jobs than people looking for work. Another glimmer of hope came in the decline in consumer prices last month. Harris says he's generally optimistic, but waiting to see the full effects of the Fed's action, which even Powell says won't be felt for several more months. In Washington, I'm Atrel Nishar for the National Desk, America's News Now. Atra, thank you. Rent prices still climbing, look at your screen here, but at a much slower rate than they have in the past 19 months. In the 50 largest metropolitan markets, the median asking rent dropped to a little more than 1700 
down $22 from October and $69 from July's peak, but a different story in the Midwest. Rents rose nearly 10% in Indianapolis and 9% in Kansas City, Missouri. The maker of the hit video game Fortnite will pay $275 million to the U.S. government. The FTC fined Epic Games for violating the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. The agency accused the company of gathering personal information of minors without their verifiable consent of their parents. Right now, U.S. safety regulators are sounding the alarm about an issue with faulty airbag inflators in some late model cars they say has killed three people. Automaker Stellantis, formerly known as Fiat Chrysler, joining the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration warning drivers of Dodge Magnum wagons, Dodge Challenger and Charger muscle cars, and Chrysler 300 sedans from the 2005 through 2010 model years to stop driving their cars until the faulty Takata airbag inflator has been replaced. Coming up on the national desk, limiting purchases. The retailers restricting shoppers buying children's pain relief medicines. You're watching the national desk, America's news now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. And anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. Welcome back to the weekend edition of the National Desk. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. Great to be here with you. Winter weather could make for some serious holiday travel trouble and last minute changes. But as the National Desk, Emily Vols explains, it doesn't mean you need to lose all your money. Over the river and through the woods, past long-term parking and airport security, only to find out that your flight to grandma's house is canceled. Well, I always like to plan for the worst, but hope for the best when I travel myself. So especially during the winter, because you just don't know what might happen from a weather perspective. Air travel is a challenge during the best of times. Add large holiday crowds and you've got a recipe for frustration. But Susan Morrow, senior vice president um, at Warwick-based Insure My Trip, trip says so travel insurance can help. Travel insurance can help ease some of the financial concerns. And sometimes it's just an inconvenience benefit, you know, so you get paid because you were inconvenienced. But to get that kind of comprehensive coverage, money for hotels if your flight is delayed or cash for new clothes if your bags get lost, you need to do a little research. It's more of a complex purchase than people realize. Um, I think they think it's like a sort of a check the box scenario, like when you're buying your airline ticket. We highly encourage people to not check the box because typically those ticket protectors 
don't cover as much as one of our less expensive comprehensive packages. For example, insurance plans for a $2,500 trip to Florida between Christmas and New Year's are typically less than 100 bucks. And if your baggage is lost or your flight is delayed, you're covered. So you can pay less and get more coverage. It just requires people to kind of look around and not fall for the whole do you really want to put your full whatever the ticket cost is at risk? I think a lot of people can relate. An important note here, the cancel for any reason insurance typically needs to be purchased within two weeks of booking and can be added after a storm has been named. Some airlines giving you the chance to rebook now due to the weather that is expected. United American and Southwest Airlines are posting travel waivers that allow rebooking without change fees or fare increases. Delta, JetBlue, Alaska and Spirit also issuing waivers for airports in the Pacific Northwest or on certain dates. Travel experts say now is the time to switch your holiday flights before other options are no longer available. Developing now, some major pharmacies are starting to ration medicine for children. CVS has set a two product limit on all children's pain relief products. Walgreens has put a limit of six over-the-counter pediatric fever reducers per online purchase. This, as the U.S. experiences one of the worst flu seasons in a decade, along with drug supply issues. With drug stores capping those purchases, parents across the country are turning to experts asking for other options to bring some relief to their children. The National Desk, Karis Harmon reports. We have uh, flu activity, COVID, and RSV that's going on in all 50 states. And so, um, so when you think about these nationwide chains, um, they, they get their products from nationwide uh, suppliers, and so they need to protect that supply of the, those medications. CVS is limiting customers to only two pain relief medications. People that shop at Walgreens are limited to buy six over-the-counter child fever medications. Walgreens said in a statement, due to increased demand and various supplier challenges, over-the-counter pediatric fever-reducing products are seeing constraint across the country. CVS also attributed the limitations to demand increases. Dr. Wes Stubblefield with the Alabama Department of Public Health says this is similar to what happened when infant formula was in high demand earlier this year. This is a problem for one mother who has two sick kids who she has to take care of. She says she had to pay extra from her pharmacist to get children's ibuprofen. The bottle cost $30, which was a lot of money compared to how much a bottle is usually, which is around $13. So I did that in the interim, but it's not a sustainable thing for us. Stubblefield advises people to use these medications sparingly and only when necessary. They don't treat the illness. Um, they can br help bring down fever, maybe relieve some pain. Um, but, uh, but the illness needs to work itself out, of course, if, in addition to any antivirals. Doctors with Alabama's Department of Public Health say if you have to give your child medicine made for adults, keep in mind doses are based off of weight. They also warn taking expired medication is risky. By the numbers now, a new analysis shows the nation's debt will surge over the next three decades. The Penn Wharton budget model finds U.S. debt will rise to be 225 percent of U.S. GDP by 2050. The nonpartisan group says in order to achieve fiscal balance, the federal government would have to increase tax revenue by more than 40 percent or reduce expenditures by 30 percent or a combination of both. In October, the national debt surpassed $31 trillion. Many of us depend on technology, right, for things like work, health care, and things as simple as telling Alexa to turn down our music. With how much we need technology, it's alarming to hear thousands upon thousands of tech workers have been laid off this year. The National Desk, Janae Bowens, is here with what's ahead for these workers. Technology is our lifeline. It's a computer in your hands with access to the world. I have the power to do so many things just by pressing a few buttons on my phone. Now, the tech industry is down after companies rushed to hire and expand quickly to meet demand during the COVID-19 pandemic. But a tech student I spoke with says there is nothing to worry about. So for the last few years, a tech degree was the way to go for college students. It guaranteed job security and a big paycheck. But now, jobs are disappearing. I definitely try not to let it deter me. Deja Williams is pushing forward with her master's degree in tech at North Carolina Central University. 
despite the layoffs in the industry. It may be down right now, but that's not to say that it won't be up a year from now or five years from now. Um, it's always fluctuating. Seeing a great demand for technology students. Joe Little, Associate Dean of Technology at Central Piedmont Community College, told me, while the number of jobs in some areas of the tech industry might be going down, the need for tech skills isn't going anywhere. Driverless cars, driverless vehicles, that is a change that is coming in the industry, for example. You know, automation and AI is another one. Uh, the ever ever growing threats for cybersecurity is another one. Little says with the ongoing threat of cyber attacks, some that could even lead to a national security issue, cybersecurity workers will always be in demand. And turns out most of the job growth for tech focused roles is in non tech sectors like healthcare and finance. A new job report from Dice shows job postings for roles like these were up 25% compared to last year. Technology is designed to change the way we work, change the way we live. It's always disruptive. According to Business Insider, an analysis by Revelio Labs of laid off tech workers shows 72% have found new jobs within three months, and 52% of those workers workers are actually earning more than they were before. It is a high demand industry, but the thing about it is what inside of it is in demand. And that's what the students have to figure out. And that's what we have to help them to do as educators is figure out where their best job opportunities lie. Tech is, it's booming. <laughs> like it's, it's a booming field right now. So I think um, just make it work for you. William says the return on investment for a tech degree is still profitable and the numbers back her up. Government data shows students who become software developers or cybersecurity analysts can expect to make more than $100,000 per year. Reporting for the National Desk, I'm Janae Bowens. Interesting story. Janae, thanks. TikTok rolling out a new feature that will offer users more insight into why certain videos appear on their feed. Users can now click a question mark icon dubbed why this video and see a list of reasons why the clip was suggested. Reasons include user interactions, which refers to content you watch, like or share, accounts you follow or suggested accounts for you, content posted recently in your region and popular content in your region. As COVID cases begin to rise once again and health officials ramp back up their messaging for people to get their COVID-19 vaccine, the fact check team diving into a study from one of the state's controversial surgeon generals linking heart health concerns to the shot. Florida Surgeon General Joseph Latipo last week announced a new study on the relationship between the COVID vaccine and myocarditis, a form of heart disease. I'm back with our fact check team tonight. Uh, Courtney, there have been many studies on this. Uh, what's behind this one? Latipo said this decision was inspired by this German study published in a medical journal called Clinical Research in Cardiology. The study was small, only 25 participants, but during autopsies, it found evidence of myocarditis in five people who died within 20 days of getting the vaccine. The authors noted that this type of study can't make conclusions about whether the myocarditis was directly related to the vaccine or determined the risk of it. Yeah, that sounds pretty inconclusive. Uh, it's a very contested subject as well. Uh, what else are we hearing from the experts on this? It really depends on who you ask, but we found that a lot of medical professionals and experts are concerned. Elena Cyrus, an epidemiologist from the University of Central Florida, worries Latipo may be fear-mongering without enough evidence. Others, like the American Heart Association, agree that the benefits of the vaccine are more significant than any small risk of myocarditis. Yeah, and important to note here, uh, for those that don't know, Latipo is a pretty controversial Bigger. In fact, his research has come under scrutiny in the past, Connor. Yeah, it sure has, Eugene. In October of this year, he faced heat from the medical community for advising against the COVID vaccine for men between the ages of 18 and 39, claiming an increased risk of cardiac-related death. There was concern among medical professionals that his analysis wasn't peer-reviewed, skewed results, didn't make data available, and didn't check to make sure deaths were heart-related. All right, we'll see what kind of reaction this new study gets. In the meantime, we'll just uh, have to wait here and stay on top of all this medical news that comes out on this. Ladies, thank you. For more on the Fact Check team's topic tonight, including links to where they found their information, be sure to visit us online at thenationaldesk.com. Americans are digging deep. Despite being under a lot of financial stress, a new report shows people are still finding ways to donate. The National Desk's Angela Brown explains. Faith and generosity often go together. Giving USA has found that 62% of religious households give to charities in the past. Last year, giving increased across the board. New signs 2022 is trending in the same direction. Just days before Christmas, Central Union Mission DC posting this urgent message 
from an empty warehouse. As you can see, we are desperately empty. We still have 500 children that haven't been sponsored. We checked back this week, toys coming in. Elise Westoff, Philanthropy Roundtable, says signs point to Americans giving more in 2022. This year on Giving Tuesday, which is a huge sign of what's to come for 2022, giving rose 15%. In 2021, Giving USA says Americans gave over $484 billion to charity, a 4% flat adjusted for inflation, with the largest portion going to religious organizations. Many of these religious organizations are not just keeping their lights on in their churches or synagogues or mosques, they're also helping their communities. They're doing outreach, um, education, providing food, job fairs. For many, giving is tied to faith. A philanthropy roundtable report cites research finding Americans with any religious affiliation gave an average of $1,600 compared to roughly $784 for those with no religious affiliation. We talked to the faithful feeding families this Thanksgiving. I love helping others and showing the love of Christ to others. But generosity knows no religion. Giving USA says individuals, foundations, and corporations all gave more last year despite inflation. Everyone expected giving to go down. That was the expectation. Um, but Americans were more generous than ever last year. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. From giving to stealing your gifts, ahead on the national desk, advice to help make sure your holiday orders don't get swiped by a porch pirate. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. From Texas residents preparing their homes for an Arctic blast to a closer look inside the D.C. area's Dulles Airport as holiday travelers pack airports nationwide. We're taking the pulse of America. But first, we start with a train derailment in Tennessee caught on camera. <laughs> This viewer video shows the impact of the Norfolk Southern train and tractor trailer crash. As you could tell by the damage, it, it really could have been a lot worse. It's hard to believe that that video. Two employees for Norfolk Southern only received minor injuries and the tractor trailer driver walked away. Once they treated the people, emergency crews turned to keeping the diesel contained. So some of that diesel spill went into the creeks. Amy Maxwell says three locomotives had large amounts of diesel, but crews were able to remove it. You can see the mangled aftermath of three locomotives and 10 cars that derailed. Maxwell says the driver stopped on the tracks waiting for a light on the other side to turn green. <laughs> Austin won't look like this over Christmas weekend. But even though no one expects a repeat of the February 2021 storm, temperatures will be cold enough to knock out power and freeze pipes. Be most prepared for 
for water even more than, than for blackouts. Professor Daniel Cohan is an energy expert. He says the focus this week should be on the potential for pipes to freeze and burst. That's likely to be the big, biggest area of risk from, from this level of temperatures uh, rather than any big widespread uh, power blackouts this time. To keep pipes from freezing, open the cabinets under kitchen and bathroom sinks to let the warm air in your house or apartment circulate. That should be enough. But to be extra cautious, let your faucets drip. You can do a uh, really slow drip. You don't, you don't even need to have it uh, be at a trickle. Outside, remove all hoses from faucets, then put a styrofoam cover over them, or you can wrap them with rags or towels. If you're going to let an outside faucet drip, Here's what Austin Waters says you need to do. You can have it drip um, from the faucet that's furthest away from um, your meter and just a really slow drip uh, can help keep that from freezing. We're already seeing increased volumes now. Henry Bird is general manager of United Airlines hub at Dulles. He says the number of travelers started picking up early this year. So we started to see our volumes start to increase probably about Thursday or Friday of last week. Bird says he expects the rest of the week to be busy with Thursday and Friday being the very busiest pre Christmas days. The busiest days after Christmas are expected to be both this coming Monday and Tuesday and the Monday and Tuesday right after New Year's. For those going by car, per AAA, the busiest days are expected to be a little different. As far as the roads go, December 23rd, December 27th, and December 28th are expected to be the very busiest days. Also January the 2nd, so after New Year's Day. Regina Ali says it appears with Christmas on a Sunday, people are extending their trips this year. We are seeing that people are, in many cases, leaving a little bit earlier, trying to get ahead of that sort of holiday rush and in many cases may be staying a little bit longer on the back end as well. Good to know. Still to come here, our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington from economic uncertainty to questions about security along the southern border. Every day, our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital to bring you the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. And as lawmakers rush to get out of town for the holidays, it was a busy one to say the least. National correspondent Atra El Nishar bringing us up to speed on two issues that have been getting a lot of attention lately. Atra, let's start with the economy. Some mixed messaging this week. Yeah, definitely. So 2022 is ending with inflation at least heading in the right direction. On Friday, we saw the latest personal consumption expenditures price index that showed prices uh, in November were still up five and a half percent from a year ago, but rose less than they did the month prior. And that was pretty much identical with what um, with what Wall Street expected. So the report also shows that the strong consumer spending that we've been seeing is likely starting to lose steam. It's still up, but it's 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 growing at, at a much smaller rate now. And that's likely a suggestion that inflation has uh, customers and shoppers around this holiday season, especially just hitting their limits. But at the same time, as this is an economy of contradictions, we also learned this week that gross domestic product growth in the third quarter actually rose much more, rose much faster than expected. Now, 
it's sort of a, a counterintuitive, but stocks fell on what would normally be that positive news because it has investors skittish that the Federal Reserve in 2023, because of that strong economic growth, could keep high interest rates uh, high for longer. Yeah, so obviously we'll continue to watch that kind of roller coaster ride with the nation's economy. In the meantime, Atra, America's southern border. Again, a big part of the conversation this week with arguments over funding, which we saw on Capitol Hill during that spending debate, as well as Title 42, that Trump era program that allows immigrants to be turned away or deported over health concerns. You looked into some developments regarding fentanyl. What did you learn? Right. So the, the, the deadly fentanyl surge that's hitting just about every American community and, and the border issues you just mentioned are really starting to to uh, to merge lanes here. So this week, the Drug Enforcement Age, uh, Administration, the DEA, uh, announced that uh, it has seized enough fentanyl or fentanyl lace pills to kill every single American, more than 370 million deadly doses. And, and the pills that they are finding too are getting more lethal. Uh, so according to an analysis by the Washington Post, fentanyl overdoses are now the leading cause of death for Americans ages 18 to 49. Now, when it comes to the border, we're also hearing from the DEA uh, that one of the biggest uh, drivers of this deadly uh, fentanyl surge uh, are two drug cartels known as the Sinaloa and Jalisco uh, court, uh, cartels. And they're basically, they say, operate, the DEA says, are operating these secret factories in Mexico using chemicals sourced from China and then using those cartels to traffic it through. So border resources are strained enough, but now they're getting caught up in this, in this deadly fentanyl surge that, again, it's hitting far, far too many Americans. Yeah, and it's going to be not only an American solution needed, but as you're pointing out, they're an international one as well. So uh, many more developments still to come on that in Washington under a lot of pressure. National correspondent Atra Elnishar, thank you so much. Didi, back to you. Scott Atra, thank you. Up next on the National Desk, keeping cash in your wallet. Which items on your gift list are actually going down in price? If you're still on the hunt for the holiday gift, the cost for a few popular items are on the downswing. Axios put together a list of consumer goods deflation. Toy prices are down 2.2% month to month. Women's coats and jackets are down 1.3% month to month. And smartphones costing nearly 10% less. That's my excuse to go shopping. Online security guide SafeWise estimates about 260 million delivered packages were stolen over the last year. SafeWise says a year ago it was about 210 million. To protect your deliveries from being stolen, make sure you get notifications of when your package is supposed to arrive and when it's delivered. Make sure you're there or ask a trusted neighbor to pick up the package. Higher prices can't compete with Christmas cheer. The National Christmas Tree Association projecting nearly 21 million live Christmas trees will be sold this season. Wholesalers raising prices on average between 5 and 15%. But the association says a recent survey found 85% of people feel Christmas trees are worth it, even with the spike in costs. That'll be all for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time. Just check your local listings. You can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great holiday, and we'll see you back here next week.